stuff that we haven't kind of done from the last week, so that's why there's no fresh material there. Um, next week, after reading week, uh, we will do um, independent component analysis and some other stuff, which I don't think you've done anywhere else. I hope not. And then we'll come on to some uh, time series stuff, but continuous variable time series. Um, okay, um, just to say, next, after reading week, um, I'll be away and I'm intending to fly in on the morning of the lecture. So, um, if everything goes well, <laughs> I will be here. However, you know how things are, so um, do I'll send you an email if I'm able to if some, for some reason my flight is massively delayed. So just pay attention. If you, for some reason I'm not here on Thursday after reading week, uh, then just read your email. Hopefully you'll get an update from me. And we'll have to reschedule it. Okay. So just bear that in mind. Um, the other thing is the, the deadline for the submission of the results, or your, 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 whatever it's called, your, um, I forgot the exact name of this competition actually, but the, the prediction competition, the recommendation. I forgot exactly the date for that, but it's soon, right? It's within, I think, a couple of weeks from now. So I'm not sure if that if it's in reading week or... On Kaggle. It's this time, it's yeah. next, time, next week. Next week, week yeah, yeah, so it's in reading week. So uh, I won't be here to, to push you all to, to do that. So <laughs> make sure that you, you do it, all right? Otherwise you're not going to get a score. The, the write-up and stuff like that, yeah. what's, how much do we have to write, what do we have to document? Um, don't worry about the write-up just yet, I mean you can write-up as you're going along, but just for the deadline at the moment, I just want yeah, you to get, get your predictions up there, so we'll, you can write the description after you've done that, so. Um, we'll get on guide like how long it has to be. Yeah, to yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, basically, okay. I mean, it will not be a huge piece of work, I mean, it will, I think it will take, you know, not more than a day or something like that. So the intention is not really to to burden you too much with that. I just want to make sure that everybody who's sort of done it is aware, you know, of what they've been doing and just kind of not just be kind of hanging around and letting everybody else do the work. Basically. So I want to be yeah. And just in terms of how much of the market's going to be result, will you end up with really important how much of it is the right time? Um, I think it will be about 50-50, maybe a little bit more 60-40, I mean, 60-40 I, in favour of the score that you get. So last year, we it was a little bit different in the sense that we, you got a score just directly on where you got on the leaderboard, but there was an, uh, an exam question which actually asked you to describe your contribution, which you didn't have to do, you didn't want to do, it was optional. Uh, this year there will be no such exam question, so it's a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's reasonable to say that you know the maybe the majority of the marks will come from how you actually perform. I mean, I'm I'm sorry, but this year I haven't. L last year I managed to sort of specify quite from the early stage exactly what that, you know, how you would, uh, you know, what you had a good idea what mark you needed, what score you needed to get in order to get say seventy percent. This year is, is tricky because I don't have a lot of statistics yet to get the, the thing, but I'll try to do that hopefully soon so you'll get an idea. But you can, the way typically it will work is that if your results are random or no better than random, you will get 40%. So if the, you know, as you go up to, you, to get 100%, you don't necessarily have to beat the, get the top score on the leaderboard, but it will be maybe you can get within, say, you know, the 95% or something like that. That was roughly something like how it worked last year. So it's, it's not that most people last year, you know, some teams did very well, they got like uh, you know, 85 95%. Some other teams didn't do quite as well as that, but you know, 65 mm -hmm. percent But it's not that difficult to get you know, reasonable. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if it's random, then Okay, good. So I wanted to show you this demo that didn't work last time. So remember we were talking about KD trees and uh, these complicated things. So this is the demo which didn't work, but hopefully works now.
Okay, so remember the point was that in this case we have 12 data points and they are here. These are the red dots. Okay, and then what we're going to do is construct this KD tree in the way that uh, we described before, which essentially corresponds to choosing, first, say, an X dimension along and a point along which it split the data into two groups, and then we choose a Y dimension, which one split the two groups, and then we switch back to the X dimension. And in this particular case, we, we end up uh, having the nodes in this framework here. So each data point corresponds to a node in the graph, and we construct the tree uh, that we discussed last time recursively. And then when we come along with a query, wherever that was, um, we basically first go down the tree to a leaf, and then we start working backwards along from that leaf. We say, you know, we, we examine the data points that actually have this leaf and co compute this distance to the query point, and then we ask whether or not its parent basically is actually closer or not. In this case, if it's closer, then that becomes the new best guess. If it's not, uh, then we don't uh, update the best guess. And then we go to the parents of this guy, in this case to here. Again, we ask you know, if there's a better guess or not. Um, and then we ask, in this case, if any points to the right of this point could actually be valid mm. using that test that we talked about last time. And if it is, you have to go down this branch of the tree. If not, you can go up. Okay, And then when you get to the top, you can then simply ask a question of whether or not anything to the left yeah, could be close and if it's uh, not possible get done. If it's possible you need to start working down this left tree. And when you start going that when going down you first of all go to a leaf and then start working your way up. Okay. Sort of eliminating uh, subtrees. So maybe I can run it again and give you you get a what you'll see actually the thing to to keep your attention on is this square. The square is the node or the data point that we are currently examining. And you'll see that this data point sort of goes up the tree and then get to a sort of a branch point and then it will s go down to a leaf on the remaining tree as it sort of gets assigned to that leaf. So it's a kind of it's a kind of recursive procedure basically. So you, each time for the remaining tree you drop to the leaf of the tree and then start working backwards. So we're going back Testing for three, do we need to go to the left? We decided not. We need to go to the left, decided not in this case. This is quite an easy one. We only did uh, four or something evaluations there. Uh, maybe we could do something more complicated. So we decided it didn't go, need to go down the branch. Does it need to go left? No. Oh, it's not too easy. Is it? Okay. So this two-dimensional stuff is quite easy. So let's increase the dimension. You'll see that um, things get less. Oops. So sorry. Here, there's no way it's going to uh, going to uh, avoid essentially computing everything. We'll probably go down to the right now. Time at 13. So the dimensionality now is, is quite high, 24. So this idea of neighborhood structure is sort of getting much weaker. So he has to basically examine everything. You see now it goes down to that, that leaf of that subtree, goes up as much as it can, down to the leaf of that subtree, and then works back now to three. I don't know why this thing is so, so slow, it's just the plotting actually. Um, but this thing is actually lightning fast and if you don't do it. Oops. <laughs> Struggling to even plot that. Oh gosh. Anyway, do you get the idea? So I mean I this is this is online actually, it's on the memory page, so maybe you can 
you take a look. So, um, like I said, this is programmed in a non-recursive way. So maybe if you like recursive programming, you can do it in a sort of a slightly neater way. But uh, I don't like recursive programming so much. So. Okay, great. Okay, so we were talking about the supervised dimension reduction, and we were talking about PCA, and uh, how that is sort of a linear representation, and that you basically have to, you can solve this in several different ways. And I gave you a derivation that the solution is given by one solution is given by the co taking the eigenvectors, the principal leading eigenvectors of the highest eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix. Okay, and that's nice. And that that solution, while it's not unique, corresponds to the one which is actually projecting the data down along to the directions of principal <coughs> or maximal variance. So these are called the the principal directions. Okay, so just again worth you know, restating that that PCA there are there are many equivalent solutions to the least squares optimal reconstruction is not unique. All that you need to do is to define the subspace. And you, any rotation within that subspace of the basis vectors is fine. They don't even have to be orthogonal. Right? You just need to describe the space, and they're all equivalent. They're all just as good in terms of least square reconstruction. Error. PCA is specific in the sense that it's, it chooses, it breaks that um, symmetry by projecting the directions of maximal variance, and it does that in a one by one way. Okay. So this was the, the digits. I think we talked about this last time. Just to again remind you that these are the original digits at the top, and these are the corresponding reconstructions of these digits. Um, what does the reconstruction mean? Well, it means that you basically, in terms of this picture here, it means that you've got a particular data point and you project it down to a plane. Okay. So what this means in, in mathematical sense is that the plane of PCA will be described in this case by two orthogonal vectors, okay, unit length, which is given to you by the, the PCA uh, solution. And there'll be some um, position then, so you take in this case uh, there were two components, okay. So your three dimensional point gets mapped down to a two dimensional coordinate vector, which is going to be how long, you, how, how far you need to go along one of these, plus how far you need to go along one of these in the plane, okay. And then that will give you a reconstruction at this point in the plane, okay. So it's a three dimensional point, okay. Okay, and this reconstruction looks more like the, the mean of the data as we move down in the number of latent dimensions. Okay, we took the best single value decomposition using PCA. And this was our, I think we got to pretty much here last time. These are this, our um, set of faces. Uh, we're basically going to try to find a low dimensional. <coughs> representation of these faces. Okay. This is the famous eigenfaces problem. Like I said, I don't know quite why people get so excited about this, but um, there you are. And this ones are, this is the first principal component, the second, third, fourth, etc. Uh, seventh one, eighth one. Um, I don't know, maybe I don't see anything particularly interesting there. Why is the first one all black, the first principal? Yeah, he's not completely black, actually. He's, um, he's corresponding to pretty much um, something very close to the mean of the data. So 
problem is that the, the contrast is maybe not so so good here. If I maybe I should have replotted this and renormalized it so that the contrast would be a little bit you'd see it a little bit better. But it's mainly just a contrast plotting pro problem, I think. Um, so this should in actual effect look much more like the, the mean of the, the data and Okay. Um, yeah, what can we say about this stuff? It's a mess. I don't know. I, I find it's. You know. So maybe maybe you could say this one here. Like maybe this is the next one. So there's a lot of variability in the hair. Maybe you could say that. Right. Uh, maybe just below the eyes. Or here there's a lot of variability in, in the eyes. So, sure. So, yeah. The first one that was that the mean of the data. Was that the first eigen. That should be the first eigen vector. I don't remember exactly. This. Okay. So now that that's fine, but in practice you often have uh, data which has got missing elements, right? So maybe you want to do PCA, but you don't have all the data. So how do you do PCA with missing data? So this is a real practical <coughs> problem. So the problem is there's no quick fix for this. So PCA is nice because it's all just an eigen problem, and you know you can you can solve it easily. Um, but there's no such one-shot solution in the missing data case. So um, there are a variety of things you can do, and this is one thing you can do. So what I'm going to suggest here is that maybe you still want to do least squares reconstruction, and you know, how can you do that with uh, with missing data? So all you need to do essentially is just you only try to do the reconstruction for the points of data that you actually have observed. Right? So for example, if we've got this vector x and i, so n remember is the data index, and i is the component of the vector. So what we could have, this is the sort of the, the reconstruction of x and i in terms of a linear combination. These are the components, and these are the basis vectors. Okay, so we want this to be small. But we don't want to worry about this contribution when we don't have, when x and i is not present. Okay, so we could have, a, say, an indicator variable x and i, gam so gamma and i. So gamma and i would be, for example, 1 if x and i is actually present. If you don't have x and i, it's not in your data, then you could set gamma and i to be 0. And that would just not include that term. And then you could say, well, whatever that is, I know the gamma, so just 1 or 0. Um, I just got some objective function now, again, as before, as a, f as a function of b and y. And I could just attempt to minimize this with respect to b and y. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And you, if you do this, you find that the optimal ways, as before, uh, satisfy um, this corner, satisfy this. Okay, so it's a linear combination. There's a projection of your high dimensional points. Um, down to something something lower, but they've got these gamma's included in this in this case. And what you could do in principle is you could say, well, I could plug this y now uh, back into this original objective function, and now I've got an objective function as a function only of b. And then I could go ahead and attempt to minimize that subject to some orthonormality constraint on b, like we did before. Okay, it's so as one you could attempt you could attempt to do. Uh, I'm going to do something slightly different here, uh, which is just a kind of iterative uh, scheme. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to, well, let's let's look at this objective function here. This thing is going to be, if I fix y, this is a quadratic function of b, which you know quadratic functions you can you know, use it to optimize. And similarly, if I fix b, this is a quadratic function of y, which again is a, it's a simple thing to optimize. So one suggestion would be that I fix, say, one variable and I optimize with respect to the other one, and then I switch them around and I optimize with respect to the other one, and I iterate that scheme. So it's a kind of coordinate-wise optimization procedure. Yeah. So it's a kind of analogous to uh, give sampling in some sense. Right? And that's going to then guarantee to go down to some, some minimum. E each stage, I will be minimizing the, the function with respect to one of the variables. 
So the rest is just you know algebraic details really. So we could um, you know, fix uh, b and then optimize this with respect to the coordinates uh, y. Okay. So that's just a simple thing, and you minimize, you differentiate with respect to y, and you get some linear equation to solve. You just do a little bit of linear algebra, and you get a set of equations, which are a function, of course, of the data, these b's, and uh, the gammas. So then the, you just have to solve some corresponding linear system, okay, where you've figured out what this y's are and what this matrix m is. And you have to do this, in this case, per, per data point. Okay, so that's, that's easy to do. Um, and then similarly, you can fix um, y and optimize with respect to b and uh, we get another linear system to solve okay so that's easy to do and then like i said you just iterate between these two pieces then if you want at the end of this you, you say well actually that's nice but it doesn't correspond to say an orthonormal matrix b but you can just because of this discussion we had the last time that actually the solution is um, independent with respect to, or it's invariant with respect to some rotation in the scaling matrix. We talked about this Q matrix before. And I can just introduce an arbitrary Q matrix, again, to re-rotate this basis matrix B such that it would be effectively orthonormal. So these are called post-rotations. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss this now, but you can, you can read that in the notes of the book if you want to see more formally how to do that. Okay, so I can, I can then construct an orthogonal uh, basis B if you want to do that. If you just care only about these squares, there's no, there's no need to do that. So here's an example. It's maybe not so clear. Maybe I'll show you another example in a minute. But on the top, we've got a, an original data matrix. And since there are 300 data points, each data point is a 100 dimensional vector. And I then remove a large number of these data points to get this matrix here. The so word is black means there's missing data. And then what I do is I, I take this matrix and I, I run this, uh, this PCA with missing data on it, okay, to try to get an idea of the underlying structure of this matrix. And then when I've got that, I can actually reconstruct the original matrix right, because if I know what um, the basis is now, I can figure out how to reconstruct the rest of the matrix by... Um, <coughs> so if I know for a particular data point... Uh, so I've learned the basis B, and I know for a particular data point what the Y and... Uh, what the Y is, what the co co coordinates are, right? I can reconstruct X by just doing this. And that includes for X for which there, there was no original x. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? No, you don't see what I mean. So, um, <coughs> okay, so we'll, we'll have minimized, we'll have minimized the subjective function, okay? Um, what does it mean? I will, that means I'll, I'll, I will have learned a B basis matrix a set of basis vectors and a y, the corresponding coordinates. Right? So what this means is that I can compute the reconstruction of any x by essentially y times by b or b times by y. Right? And I will have a, a y and a b and that will do that for, for an i, for all i. It doesn't matter whether or not the original i was observed or not. Right, I can still do this and I will get a value for any uh, xn i, or reconstruction, approximate reconstruction for any xn i. So I can, I can fill in the missing data using this procedure. Okay, and this is what's given by here. So you don't see this very well, but this is very similar to that, but it's remarkably similar. And the reason is because even though there's a huge amount of data missing here, actually this 
data was really constructed from a very low dimensional uh, linear system which consisted only of something like five dimensions. So there were 300 data points um, and 100 dimensions, but the effective dimension was very, very low. It's like five or something like that. So effectively, that means that even though it's sparse, there's enough information here in this matrix to actually identify what that basis is. Okay. So once I know that, I can then get a very good reconstruction of the original matrix. So let's show you another example. Here's another example. Okay, so maybe a little bit easier to see. So this is the on the top of this is the data. This is on the bottom is the original matrix. Okay, uh, 100 data points in 10 dimensions, and then I I got rid of some of the data points values at the top, and this is the reconstruction. So it's not perfect in this case, but uh, it's probably not too bad. You should see some similar structure. Do we see similar structure? It's probably easier for you to see than me, actually. Okay. Are you, yeah, is it impressive? No. Did you take data out at random? Yes, I did. But I didn't generate data at random. So I'll explain how to, um, how I generated the data. Maybe looking at the map lab, you can see it. So what do I do? I, I make a random matrix B, and the random Weight vector, uh, I guess that corresponds to y or something like that. Um, okay, so the data is going to be x is b times by w. So, in other words, um, bear in mind the dimensionality of this. So, so b is um, 10 by 3, and w is 3 by 100. So, the, the actual latent dimensionality here is only 3. Okay, so you get you know 10 by 100 matrix when you multiply these two things, but the, the underlying dimensionality of the data is only is only three, not not 10. Okay, so I create this matrix X that way, and then I delete at random you know 80% of the data, and then I I reconstruct it. I actually wrote this routine SVDM. It's a kind of it's just a similar thing to the PCA, but I just do it in, in an SVD context. So, but again, you can read the notes if you really care about that. But it's essentially the same, the same idea. Um, so maybe if we give it a little, maybe a couple of hundred more, maybe some more data points, maybe we'll see it slightly better. So we'll compare. Does that look any better? Let, 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 let me go to no, something. It does look similar. Let me go to the you know, really ridiculous case. Let's say that um, there's only one underlying dimension, right? Not, not 10. Then we shouldn't need that many data points to figure out what's going on. Hmm. Okay. Let's. Uh, about deleting less of the data. Yeah, but um, it's not so exciting. Okay, let's do a little more data. It's obvious to assume that, but yeah. 
I mean, it can't be perfect. You know, it's not. Um, but it's you know you, you see something pretty structurally quite similar. I think the problem is that it's also also structured from the randomness that you poked out. The data. That's also true. Yeah. Yeah. There are new lines, you know, because it's, it's almost uh, when you take out the data, it's almost you know somewhat more uniformly. Yeah, I don't know how quick it would be, but could you do it with the Gaussian distribution instead of the random? Mm -hmm. You mean a Gaussian distribution in some particular place, like to like a there or something like that? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So when you're you, you've got three latent dimensions, and then yeah. you're creating ten points according to those latent variables. Mm -hmm. Maybe instead, rather than just being random, creating create a uh, problem from a Gaussian distribution. So it would be B, would it? You change. Well, B is from a Gaussian distribution already. Is that is that a Gaussian distribution? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. Um, I mean, what we could do is we could. Hmm. Yeah, it'd be nice to sort of see maybe something slightly more visually. So maybe next time I'll try to sort of take maybe say the. Um, Maybe some faces or something like that, you know, where we can kind of like block out the, the nose of some people, you know, and all bits of their face and then fill it in. That would maybe be a little bit more visually uh, interesting to see. So, okay, I'll, I'll make a note to myself. But in principle, it should work, you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be terribly bad. But because uh, um, you saw that faces do actually have kind of, you know, reasonable low dimensional structures for them, so we should expect to see something. Okay, so this is um, this area or this branch of mathematics is called matrix completion. So the general idea of you know, if you have a matrix with missing elements and you want to fill in those elements, that's called matrix completion. So PCA is one way to do or this linear you know, these squares is one way to do matrix completion. And actually, many problems in Machine learning can be considered matrix completion problems, including things like the famous you know, collaborative filtering, Netflix kind of prediction problems. If you like, you can view these as matrix completion problems as well. So why does it work? Well, you know, we cannot do this. If this if this matrix here were just a random matrix, we've got no chance. You know, there's no, what can we do? There's nothing there. The point is, it's not. It's, it's by it's by no means a random matrix. There's a, there's a lot of structure in this matrix. Okay, so more generally, we can think about these uh, matrix uh, completion problems also in terms of this way, which is a way to decompose a matrix. So the idea is that for structure, we will, we will do a factorization of a matrix into a lower dimensional or representation. Okay, so we're going to think there's some data matrix X, which I like to think about in terms of the, each column is a data point. And we're going to make that factor it into some kind of basis matrix D by M. And then there's going to be some weights or a component matrix Y is M by M. And you can see that because we saw how uh, PCA could be considered a, in a form of SVD, then SVD is a, is, a, is a factorization of the X matrix in terms of its singular values. So you can see that uh, <coughs> also you know, through the least squares representation that PCA is a form of matrix decomposition. Okay, so there are many, many methods in engineering and the sciences which are essentially matrix decomposition methods and or tensor decompositions in a more general sense. Okay, so probably nearly everything that you can think about doing, in some sense, you could squeeze into a matrix or a tensor decomposition, including things like lin latent Dirichlet allocation, etc., yeah. collaborative filtering, and all kinds of things like that. Now, what kind of matrix decompositions might you like to consider? And there are two general classes. One's called under, and this is called overcomplete. So under complete, what does it mean? It means that, like in PCA, we're trying to find a lower dimensional representation of the data. So in this case, here there are a set of data points, these dots, 
And we're trying to express these, in this case, two-dimensional data points by a lower dimensional representation. In this case, we've just got one vector. Okay, so we want to try to expi explain, in this case, each of these points is somehow, the two-dimensional points is somehow some di distance along the a line. Okay, and what would that would mean is that in terms of the matrix decomposition, the basis vectors would be, uh, would be you know, high dimensional, because they're trying to represent the high dimensional data, um, but they'd be uh, quite short. So um, this D would be high, like you know, uh, 100 or something like that, uh, M would be the, the dimensionality in the PCA of the actual basis that we're trying to, the lower dimensional representation. So this would be a, a kind of a tall matrix and it would be thin, okay, so these are called thin matrices or tall and thin matrices. So that's the, when mathematicians talk about uh, matrix decomposition, that's PCA will be a, a thin matrix decomposition for that. Okay, and you'll see similar things which you call like a thin SVD if you go into MATLAB or that's what people mean by thin. You could, uh, bizarrely, perhaps go the other way. You could say, I have more vectors than I have dimensions. This would be an over-complete representation. All right, so we would try to represent this point as a linear combination, for example, of uh, these five vectors. Sounds stupid, right? It's pretty, you know, it seems completely redundant. Why the heck would you want to do that? Um, it's a good question. Why would you want to do this? So people, particularly in um, some of the branches of the sciences, say the, uh, if you think about neuroscience, for example, it's quite interesting to think about this idea. So whilst in PCA, uh, we make typically no restriction on the the kind of basis vectors you could have. There could be, you know, these these eigenfaces, for example, are completely full. Like right? have a real, real value per dimension. But there are some situations where you might think, well, I, I, you know, it's expensive for me to, in some sense, represent a a real value vector. Maybe I don't want to communicate this somehow. Right. Maybe it's this great, if you if you tell me you know ask me how to reconstruct these faces, you would need to send me uh, a bunch of eigenfaces in order to do that reconstruction, along with the corresponding coordinates or components of this particular data point. So think about things like in terms of compression, right? So instead of uh, one way to to say uh, reconstruct an image would be um, first of all you send all of the eigenfaces across, like say the, the top 10 eigenfaces, okay? And then for each new uh, face that you want to transmit across this channel, you don't need to send any more of the eigenfaces, you just send the low dimensional uh, representation, the coordinates or components of that face in the eigenspace, <coughs> right? So that might be something low dimensional, it might be like a, you know, a 10, it would be a 10 dimensional vector. It's not now a face dimensional vector. So for each face, you transmit then this, this 10 dimensional vector. And then you reconstruct the other, other, the other side of this channel. You reconstruct your, uh, your, your face by taking that linear combination of the eigenfaces. You understand? So th this is a classical compression technique which people, you know, engineers use. This is the you know, least squares is the standard compression method in it. So when you, you want to send a video or something like that, you just use these squares to compress the, the signal this way. Um, but somebody, somebody might say, well, for whatever the reason, actually sending those eigenfaces at the start is also expensive. It's just too much to, to do that. You might want some simpler thing. Maybe you might want to say, send just sparse binary vectors. So instead of sending a, uh, say, 100-dimensional real vector, you might want, to, uh, or say, 10 100-dimensional real vectors, 
it might be cheaper for you to send, say, uh, 100 uh, binary uh, 100 dimensional vectors, which, are, which is very sparse. It doesn't have many non-zero elements. And this kind of situation is what people believe happens in, in biology. So if you want to think about the way the world uh, bio biological systems represent the world, they typically are over representation. So if you think about um, you know your your receptive fields in your in your in your eye, basically you have a huge number of receptive fields, each of which is looking at a sparse part of the image. So this responses, you have a very large number of responses. And essentially is the the receptive field is just looking at a very small part of the original image. And that corresponds to a sparse uh, vector. Okay, and then your brain, when it goes down the visual processing the hierarchy, the layers, it takes these sparse representations and, and uses them. And it's for some reasons that the neuroscientists are able to explain better than me, the, um, this is much more energy efficient. So it's, uh, in terms of the pure energy of sending and transmitting these signals, there are efficiencies there. So over-redundant or over-complete representations are very, very um, heavily used in, in, uh, in, or believed to be used in the, in the real world, actually. OK, so we're going to look at um, another kind of representation which is a bit like PCA, but we're going to think about it in a probabilistic sense. Now the interesting thing about this is that you can do quite a lot of things with this. So you can try to solve Netflix with this. Uh, you can try to, say, decompose the internet into an interesting structure with this. All kinds of interesting things you can do with this. Okay, this is like this is what people used to do and still do in some communities before latent Dirichlet allocation came along. And some people still do this in preference to latent Dirichlet allocation because it's much simpler. Okay, so we're going to use it in some way to actually, and the example we'll look at is to try to decompose uh, citations and documents in terms of science. So the idea will be that you have a bunch of documents, scientific articles, and you also have a bunch of <coughs> citations. So each article, it references some other article. And so we're going to have a matrix uh, of, uh, it's going to be, let's say there are a thousand documents in this system. This matrix will be a thousand by a thousand. And if there's an element in the ijth entry of this matrix, it means that the ith document cites the jth article. OK. And then we want to try and understand if the structure of the citation matrix. We want to then figure out some kind of communities of uh, scientists and topics and things like that. Okay, that's the idea. And this will turn out to be a matrix decomposition problem. Okay, so in this case we're looking at two objects, X and Y, but there's no pro problem in principle if you think how to extend this to many, many more objects. X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Okay, but we'll just do it for the two case. Um, so, uh, in general, the domain of the variable x could be, say, uh, discrete index up to i. The domain of variable y could be discrete index, say, up to j. And you have a corresponding data set of these collections, uh, x n, y n. So just index. And this uh, citation case, you know, yeah, x might be the document, and y uh, might be the document it cited. So document three cited document number seven. In that case, i and j will be the same. So you, you can get then, from this set of data here, you can get a, say, a count matrix of the, the number of times that, um, in this case, a document i cited article document j. Right, just by listing, running over all of the elements of your retraining set. Right, so you just end up with a in this case, a positive matrix of, of numbers, C, I, J. Then for fun, I'm just going to normalize that to get a, a probability, just a normalized thing. Okay. This is like some. It's just convenient to do that. It's not a big deal. 
Okay, so now I've got this matrix, and I want to try to see if there's some structure in this matrix. Okay, so this matrix here, Pxi and Xj, I'm going to try to find a decomposition, say, with some latent variable k, which is going to be a small number. So k is going to be, say, much smaller than i or j. And I'll say something like, well, um, this thing here I'll represent as, say, like a kind of conditional independence in a graphical model. I could say, well, you know, if I knew this latent object k, which is there's only a small number of them, this would be sufficient to make i independent of y. So the conditional independence assumption in some sense going here. Right, so knowing k, I know i, and knowing k, I know j. They've rendered conditionally independent. And I'll sum them <coughs> over p of k. Right, and this will give me my reconstruction of my, of my data. And I, I call these things, maybe put a p tilde to say these are the approximate things I want to, these are the objects I want to find. You know, so my original p matrix will be decomposed into this into these factors here. And if you call that, say, overall, it would give me some approximation p tilde of the original matrix p. And this is clearly a form of matrix decomposition because this is, you know, we could see this is the bik term. I could collect these two together here as the sort of the components term, and then we're summing over k. So it's a kind of matrix decomposition. This is a special one, though, because these are positive numbers here. Okay, so it's a kind of positive matrix decomposition problem. So I'm decomposing, it's a positive count, so I'm de going to decompose a positive matrix into uh, positive matrices, factors, po 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 positive matrix factors. Okay, and the question is how to do that. So we could do least squares in some sense, that would be one thing you could try to do, happy to do that. Um, but with probability, you know, things like likelihoods or this kind of sense are more typical, right? And it turns out that we can think about, um, you know, KL divergences in terms of probabilities are more natural sort of you know, distance measures, if you like, or deviation scores than, say, these squares, right? If I gave you two probability distributions and I said, well, I want you to find, make it such that these two probability distributions are similar, then the KL divergence would probably be the most natural, or one of the more natural things to think about using. So, sorry, just yeah. um, how is it that picking K like sufficiently small will yeah. make that conditional independence assumption like just fine? Well, we are we, we are going we are going to make <coughs> that conditional independence assumption. So we, we're going to say effectively that this variable K, um, maybe I should call it Z actually. So we've got you know, x and y. And we're going to assume that this thing is somehow got this kind of structure to it. So it's an assumption. I mean, obviously, if the data is not really of this form, mm -hmm. then it's not a good assumption. Sure. But, uh, we're going to try to fit the data, a model of that form. Okay. okay, so hopefully that's clear. So this is, this is going to be a little bit um, detailed, but it might be worth it because this came up in an exam not that long ago, so maybe uh, try to pay attention for the next uh, 20 minutes or something. Sorry, I think we can yeah. probably start with the yeah. complicated stuff. We could ask about formula. Um, so it basically says that they are conditional independent given Z. Right? Yes, exactly. And sh that shouldn't be the probability of Z squared. Shouldn't the P of Z come up with each of those terms? No. No, no. Remember from Bayes' rule, we've got like. So we. Sorry. So then, you know, p of x, y, p of x and y is the sum over z of p of x, y, z. That's, you know, that's kind of a, uh, just a marginalization. So we could say, well, sum over z of p x, y given z is z. So this is always true. This is a, 
yeah, without a loss of generality, basically. Okay, um, and then you just put this And then you basically up. just put this up. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so now we're going to... Uh, we're going to try to... So remember, the, this is, sounds a little bit strange, but the pro, what are the parameters of this problem? The parameters are actually the factors of P, factors P tilde. There are going to be three factors, three sets of parameters. Right? It's going to be the P tilde of x given z. It's going to be the P tilde of y given z. And it's going to be the P tilde of z. These are the three matrices, and each matrix is a parameter. Right? And we want to find those parameters which will give then as a p tilde of x and y, which is the product of those three matrices, such that the KL divergence between the p of x and y is similar to the p tilde of x and y. That's the, the object. And if we can find you know, those parameters then which minimizes KL divergence, we're, we're, we're happy. That's the, that's the object of this game. Okay. Is that kind of meaningful? I mean, what, 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 maybe another way to think about it is, if this matrix thing is confusing you, just think about this. What have we got? We've got we've got a matrix uh, of elements which are non-zero, not so non-negative, and they sum up to one. So, if you wanted to, you could say. I could write that down and actually forget about the matrix structure if I wanted to. I could say, well, that's just some vector which sums up to one as a histogram. I could call that probability distribution. And I'm going to represent you know, that probability distribution by another probability distribution. And so I've got two discrete probability distributions. I can take the KR diversion between them. And I want to set the parameters such that both of these are as close as possible. It's just that this particular problem's got a little bit more structure there because of the matrix formula. So a good one, practical question is once you find your z, yeah. how do you then use that one? We're going to use that to, in this case, find um, representative communities of uh, citations. And you'll see in the in when we do the actual example later. I will try to, when I do the citations with the documents, I'll basically find um, which let's get the right get this right, right, right way around. Um, but each community, which are the most um, cited documents or something like that, or the most representative documents of that community. Um, so it might be, for example, if you're looking at things something like uh, you know collaborative filtering, it might be the if this matrix might be something like you know users and films, and we might be able to say then figure out. Um, you know, what are, there will be some kind of latent topic there, which I don't know what it would correspond to, but it might be something like the genres of films. So we might find out that all of these films belong in this particular genre, or something like that, and that would correspond to you know, the, the, the Z in this case. Okay, so the, the rest is a little bit, uh, so that's a big, that's a big picture, and the rest is just, um, you know, technical exercise, a little game, but hopefully it's not that, Complicated. So this is the KL divergence using my funny angle bracket notation for expectation. Um, we want to minimize this. So P, remember, is, is fixed. We cannot change P. We only going to adjust P tilde. So we can forget about this term. So minimizing this is essentially equivalent to maximizing this this term. So that's like saying maximum, maximum likelihood, right? That's the usual kind of thing. So we want to maximize this term here. And remember, p is just given by then uh, p of x, y in our case, we've got two variables. So we want to maximize this thing. So this is like a kind of maximal uh, expected likelihood in some sense. Okay, where this is the thing that we know, and we want to we want to learn that. Now the way that we, you know, one way to do this is a uh, question. You know, you're free, as I always say, to say you don't. I don't care about the m. You know, I'm sick of it. I'll just. I know what p tilde is, I'll write that down as a product, and I'll just bung that in some optimization routine. Absolutely fine. Go ahead. You know, uh, maybe it gives you a great algorithm. I, I haven't tried it myself, but um, probably I should have done it. 
in uh, lieu of that, you could do something else, which is an, an EM style algorithm. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to show you how to do it if you desire to do this. Okay? And it will at least give us a simple iterative algorithm, which is guaranteed to at least get to a lower goal. Okay, so the usual kind of thing. So when you get more familiar with this, this is the obvious thing to do. Okay, so <coughs> I am first of all going to uh, consider the KL, diver KL divergence between Q of Z given X and Y and E tilde of Z given X and Y. Why on earth do I do this? You'll find out later. And uh, what the heck is this Q? It's just some distribution, any distribution you like. Okay? On Z, given X and Y. Alright, so I write this thing down, and uh, that's given on the right hand side. That's what the KL is. It's the Q log Q minus Q log P term. And as we know, this is non negative, right? The K other which is always bigger than zero or equal to zero. So that's handy. So what that means, well, we'll use this in a sec. Uh, so what do I mean by P tilde of Z given X and Y? Well, I use Bayes' rule to, to do that. So that gives me this uh, P tilde of X, Y, Z over P of X and Y. So what I can do is I can use that bound on the top. Uh, and I can plug in this p tilde z given x and y, right, in this log term here. So I get a log p tilde of x, y, z minus log p tilde of x, y in the numerator. This log 1 over is minus log. Okay. And then that log p tilde of x, y term, that's not a function of z. So when I sum over z, the q term will just sum to 1. So that means I get a bound by saying that log p tilde of x, y is bigger than or equal to when I switch on the other side, you know, the entropy of q plus this so-called energy term. Right. So this may look mysterious, but think about it. I mean, basically, this is exactly what you do in EM, right? You want to get a bound on the, the likelihood. And the way that you get that, this is just a bound on the log likelihood. And the, the, the convenience here is that whereas the, the likelihood itself, you know, we don't have direct access to this thing. This object here, in our case, is given by a matrix product. Right? It's a product of three factors. So um, that's a log of a sum, and that's kind of painful for us to, you know, to, to, to deal with. But the advantage here is that we've got the, 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 just the product of the factors here. We don't have the um, the sum over over k over, or over z anymore to do. Okay, so this is the, the similar kind of uh, advantage you have in the end. So that's why this is a very natural thing to do. Okay, so we're not there yet. The original objective is a, uh, it contains a, a sum of this over x and y right, for the original data problem. So we have to sum this whole thing, but we're summing over bounds over positive things, so we're not changing the bounds, so the bound stays the same direction. So I can get L just by summing this over P of X and Y on the, on the right, and this gives me a bound. And I just use the fact that P tilde of Z given X and Y, so it's this joint distribution, is P of Y given Z, P of X given Z, P of uh, P tilde of that Z, which is this. So that's nice. So the parameters now of this problem, they crop up in these kind of independent contributions here. So now we're, we're just down to the usual EM thing. We are going to do a coordinate-wise optimization procedure where we will, first of all, we'll fix Q. However we get that, we don't know, but I'll come back to that later. And for a given Q, we'll optimize this lower bound with respect to the parameters, so mainly this term, this term, and this term. That will be easy. That will be relatively easy to do. Okay. And then once we've got those optimal parameters, we'll figure out what is the best Q to do given P tilde. And that's the EM. And then we'll, then we'll we'll go back and forwards between these two steps, the E and the M steps. Okay. So in the M step, we are going to um, say 
In this case, we want to maximize, you know, figure out for a given Q, we want to figure out some of the parameters. So let's look at one of the parameters. Let's look at, say, what about this P tilde Z parameter? Okay, where, where does that appear in the objective function? Well, it only appears here. Okay? There's nowhere else that P tilde of Z appears. So I can just isolate the contribution of P tilde of Z in this expression and maximize this right hand side with respect to that contribution alone if everything else is fixed. Okay? So the contribution there is given by that's the contribution of uh, P tilde of Z. So, okay, let's look at this thing. Um, if you were to think about this Q of Z, X and Y, right, and you multiply that by P, X, Y, and you sum over X, Y, that's a distribution in Z. Right? So I claim that this object The sum over x y of p of x y times by q of z given x y. This is a distribution in z, and I could call that uh, p tilde of z. But let's call it something other than p hat, whatever. It's, I claim it's a distribution. Why is it a distribution in Z? Well, if I sum over Z, it has to sum to 1. If I sum this over Z, right, I put the sum over Z here. This is its distribution, Q, that sums to 1. Then I'm left with distribution here, that sums to 1. So it sums to 1. So whatever this object is, it's a distribution in Z. I can, can be considered a distribution in Z. So what that means is that top term then would look like the sum over z, right? I can call that thing, say, p hat of z, to summing over x and y, times by log p tilde of z, right? So remember now, what I want to do is I want to find the optimal p tilde, which maximizes this right side. Right, so I'm free to, say, do this. That doesn't change the objective function in the sense that if I want to maximize with respect to p tilde of z, p hat is fixed at the moment, so I can just add on this constant. But this is then uh, the negative KL divergence between p hat of z and p tilde of z. So then if you suddenly says, well, given p hat, what's the optimal p tilde to maximize this? Is this well, it's that p tilde which minimizes the KL divergence. So the optimal thing is to set p tilde equal to p hat, because then this is 0. Okay. So in other words, the optimal p tilde is given by p hat. That's cool, right? There's no need for the garage multipliers, nothing is necessary. So you can do similarly for the other two uh, p tilde variables. You can do exactly the same argument. When you add and subtract. You know, add on this sort of you know British term. You realize the KL divergence is there, and this will give you that the ultimate choice of p tilde of x given z is proportional to this object, and similarly the optimal p tilde y given z is proportional to this object. Okay, so this is good. So if you knew what q were, what the this Q, Z, and X, and Y were, then you have an update, a set of update formulae for the P tilde variables. So the only thing we need to know now is what is this Q tilde we need to get. So that's the, that's the E step. So this is the M step now. So we need to do the E step. Well, um, this is easy because the, I like an EM, basically the, the optimal E step is given by you know, setting basically the distribution equal to the, uh, the true distribution of the all, with the all parameters. So this, the reason for that is that uh, this whole derivation started from 
considering this KL divergence here. And we want to maximize the bound, which corresponds to minimizing the KL divergence. So if P tilde is fixed, then immediately you know the optimum Q is there given x and y is, the, is P tilde of Z given x and y. Because that's the one which actually minimizes the KL divergence. So you're done. That's basically the same in, in the M algorithm. So you know then that the optimum Q is Z given x and y is P tilde of Z given x and y. What is P tilde of Z given x and y? Well, it's P tilde of the joint distribution, x, y, z, over P tilde of x, y, where P tilde of x, y, z is given by product of the three components, and then the denominator is the, is the sum of that over z. Okay. And obviously, what I mean by this is that these are the P tilde's from the previous iteration, like in the end. Okay. So, so that's it. So what we'll do is we'll we'll come along, say we'll we'll guess maybe these factors P tilde. Okay, in any way we like, they've got to be things which just sum up to one uh, in the appropriate way. We will then, um, with those, we will figure out what this formula is for Q. Given that formula for Q, we'll then update the P tilde according to this expression where our data is, is coming in here. Okay, that will give us our new P tilde's and then we'll just update the Q this way. Okay, and uh, it's guaranteed to converge, isn't it? So, yeah. I'll show you an example then. This is called um, P, uh, let's say, probabilistic latent semantic analysis. Or, I never remember the terminologies for this stuff. Probabilistic, probabilistic latent semantic indexing. I don't quite know what the difference is between those two things. But this is. Um, yeah. Okay. So it's basically a kind of positive matrix decomposition, and uh, you know you can play around uh, to the cows come home with this kind of stuff. Here's another way to play around with it. You could say, uh, I don't like that decomposition. I prefer another one. I could say, uh, maybe I want to think about not a joint distribution, but maybe like a conditional distribution. You could say, well, maybe. For example, each column of this matrix, I want to sum to one. I don't want the whole matrix to sum to one. That would be kind of like a conditional matrix. So you might say, well, in that case, it's more appropriate for me to think about a decomposition this way. This latent variable k, which I'm going to you know, insert in here, which will be lower dimensional, which will give, say, some kind of factorization like this. Again, it's a conditional independence um, assumption here. Okay, So you might call this a conditional PLSA. All kinds of, you know, you can pretty much make any graphical independence structure you, you like and just play the same game. Right? It's just a, a trivial modification of these the algorithm. And the EM algorithm again goes through as before. So here's an example. We've got uh, here a bunch of beautiful people, four of them. And what we're going to do is we're going to play an artificial game now. I'm going to take a four, um, I'm going to make a random um, convex combination of these four images. So what, what I mean is that the first time, for example, I might choose um, take 0.1 of this guy plus 0.4 of this guy plus 0.2 of her and 0.3 of him. I'm going to sum them all together by those weighted amounts. And that gives me an image which you can't see very well in the top left hand corner. The next time I'll do it, I'll take you know some other amount of him, him, him and her. And I'll add them together in random amounts. And so I'll, I'll create them a, a set of data like that. This is going to be your data set. That's all that you know. Okay? You don't know anything else. You just have this data set. And your task will be to take this data set and find the faces which made up this data set, knowing that uh, a positive combination of positive faces gave rise to this data. And that's all that you know. So what we can do is we can run um, 
In this case, I run a uh, the, this conditional PLSA, <coughs> right? So, um, to learn the the basis and the corresponding components. So the basis vectors here uh, are these. So there's a four dimensional thing. So what what you're saying in this case is, you know, whatever the dimensionality here of this image is, it's you know, it's high dimensional. Uh, few hundred. <coughs> Actually, the true dimensionality of this data is really just four. There are only four, you know, basis vectors. And basis vectors, if you like, in some sense, are these these images, the base images. And when you run this algorithm, just starting from some random initialization, it converges to this. So these are the these are the um, this is the solution from the PLSA. This is the basis that we find is the p tilde of x given k for k of z, z going from 1 to 4 in this case. So it works. Right. You had no, uh, just these images and we figure out these are the people that uh, made it up. Now you could say, that's fine, I could, um, I could though try to find say the best least squares reconstruction of these data points using a four-dimensional latent space, right? That would also be an interesting thing to do. And PCA is optimal. It's the optimal least squares reconstruction. Okay, so we find the corresponding eigenfaces. And they're given by these ones here. These are the eigenfaces. Uh, and when you run the simulation, you select it, you pre-select it, and you want four. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I cheat in that sense that I, you know, obviously I, I knew how I constructed this data set, and I said I also I know the latent dimensionality, but that's all that I said. You know, the algorithm only knows that actually the latent dimensionality really is four here. It's just that. And then there is some linear combination. Yeah, yeah. So it, it knows that, um, the, 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 it assumes at least, and it's the correct assumption, that, that the data set here is made up of a, basically adding a, a positive amount, common, a convex amount, switch sum to one each time, of a positive basis, four positive basis vectors. These, I shouldn't say basis, I mean, these basis vectors are not orthogonal necessarily, right? there's no constraint about that. Yeah. But the argument, that's with the mean subtracted optimally. I can't remember, actually. <laughs> I know you're interested in that, but I can't remember. <laughs> it's um, so bad, it's just so bad. It's probably... I've never seen anyone like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's the children of the couple. Yeah. <laughs> but what what is it, what is interesting about this is so, um, you know, you, you see of course the you, you don't get this separation. Obviously, the you know, it's not. I'm not really saying very much here. I'm just saying that you know, if you if you're looking for this, you know, solution, then you should use this. Put this method. Um, even though the reconstructions you get using, if you were to take a, you know, convex, a, a linear combination, not necessarily a convex combination, but a linear combination of these basis vectors to try to reconstruct these images, this is optimal. You will not do, you cannot do better than that in terms of minimizing the squared reconstruction. So this one, how, this one will have a worse, a worse square root of the PCA. It's not possible to be PCA. But sometimes you don't care about that. You're looking for something else. You're not necessarily looking for the p squared optimum. You're looking for some other decomposition, which is more meaningful to you. Right? So you might also say, well, here's a um, these are now our original images, uh, okay, and I, I just want to decompose these original images now into some positive combination of some base images, if you like. So I'm going to assume 49 base images, okay, and I want to say that each one of them, each image itself, is some 
convex combination of uh, these images. Okay. And uh, these are the 49 images that are learned on this PLSA, conditional PLSA. So I don't know what it is. I, mean, I, I don't write it down, but you know, so the guy in the top left would be a, um, actually that's the reconstruction, I think, on the top left. Yeah. So that would be some mini combination of these 49 images. And it's a kind of, it's a little bit more interpretable than the Nagat basis because in some sense, I mean, I, yeah, that is not very meaningful, but if you, know, if you think about somebody that wears glasses or doesn't wear glasses, you know, the fact that somebody is wearing glasses, it's a positive thing onto their face, right? So in some sense, or, you know, if somebody's, um, you know, if some people are bald and other people have got hair, then you want to add the hair on, right? So it, it's not kind of like, so in some sense, you know, there are many situations where you want to think about that the object that you've got is a kind of, you know, is, is obtained by adding things in, positive amounts of stuff. But you, you can't really think about, well, add, um, you know, I'll add a bit of hair and subtract something else. That's, I mean, maybe you could find that useful, but here that's not the case. You can only add things up, so you can compose the image from positive amounts, so you cannot subtract things. So you might say, uh, you know, maybe you will see like, you know, foreheads coming in. Right, like this guy's got a you know, particularly high forehead, or big chins, or um, yeah. That kind of strange things like it will be a nose that's not you know quite uh, centralized. Yeah, I mean this is kind of interesting that you know it looks like a Hannibal Lecter <laughs> situation, but I guess what's happening is that you know these kind of people uh, look like that, but you know maybe you need to add a nose in somewhere at some point. So I'd, I'd hope that we kind of you know maybe there's noses you know which are, get added in. Okay, so let's go back to this uh, citation situation. So how do we how do we do this? So just remind you again, but, uh, in this case, it's a special uh, application. This one says we have square matrix. So we've got a number of documents, index, and uh, the number of documents is D. And D is going to be the document, and C is going to be the citation index. Okay, so they're both going from 1 to D. So uh, yeah, you have a... Um, you get a count then of the number. If there's a, um, you know, if CIJ is ten, what does that mean? It means that uh, document I um, um, well, yeah. Let's say not ten. Let's say it's one. So document I would cite document J. If that's one. I mean, it's, made, it's not very meaningful to think that you could cite it ten times. The same document typically would just be one or zero. Okay, but then I'll maybe I'll renormalize this to get sure I get a probability distribution over the whole matrix, and then I can run either you know PLSA or conditional PLSA, whatever I like, to try to decompose this this probability, this positive matrix, into positive amounts of other matrices. Um, so <coughs> okay, so the compute the corpus is there are there are thirty thousand computer science research papers. So from this corpus, the the guys who did this uh, basically extracted four thousand two hundred twenty documents. Um, for these four thousand two hundred twenty documents, they uh, there are thirty eight thousand odd citations. So I guess these are. These are the 4,000 documents, and, and we have then a 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, where the number of non zero elements in that matrix will be 38,000. Okay. And then these guys, they use this joint PLSA decomposition to try to find seven latent topics. Okay, so 4,000 uh, 4, um, times by seven times by 7 times by 4,000. That would be the decomposition in terms of PLSA. 
Um, and when they've done that, they, I don't know what algorithm they use, but I guess it's the EM style thing. So then they basically looked at this thing here. So, so Z, remember, goes from 1 to 7, and C will be the, the citations. <coughs> so what this means is there's a, the first of all, you'll get a P. You can figure out what P of Z is. So you can find out the you know, P of Z will, uh, there are seven Zs. You can find which is the most highest probable Z. Okay, that would be the, say, we'll call that topic number one. Just, we can just re, you know, relabel topics. So that's the most prominent topic. And then say for topic number one, we could figure out which are the highest, which documents are they such that C is the highest. So that would mean you know, for, for topic number one, which are the most likely documents that would be cited. Right, so this, you could interpret that as a kind of the most uh, eminent papers in that, in that, in that field, as a field. Right, so remember this is all done without knowing anything about topics or fields. Right? It's just a kind of a latent uh, variable. So topic number one, or factor number one, as they call it, um, these are the top three papers which are cited in factor or topic one. Learning to predict by the methods of temporal differences, neural network elements to solve difficult learning problems, critical issues in temporal difference learning. So, actually, you know, looking at those, <coughs> you could say, you know, we as humans, we could say, well, actually, you know, this looks like reinforcement learning kind of topic. I mean, that's just something that we you know we can, you can impose that in brackets. That's not something that you know, that's just a label that we can perhaps give a, a posteriori. It's not something that we the algorithm uh, does, but we could say effectively it's learned the reinforcement learning topic. Um, and similarly for the other topics. Okay, so um, you can group papers then into, into topics and the most eminent papers per, per topic. And you can imagine doing you know, similar things, you know, we talked about uh, at some point uh, in the discourse of the previous you know, on graphical models, like how you could say, take say the internet and consider that as a markup chain and do a decomposition of that into, um, you know, to find out the equilibrium distribution and you know the prominence of papers and you know, this kind of thing. But similarly here, you could take the internet and you can use this as the, you know, the interaction matrix, what can, the hyperlink matrix, and you can use a, you know, a PLSA style decomposition to try to understand what communities there are in the structure of the, in the, in the, in the hyperlink structure. So there may be communities who are, you know, in this big community, these, these, are the, these are the pages that you should go to, or these are the pages that people would go to in this community, etc. And you can find latent communities, you know, all kinds of graph theoretic related uh, analyses you can, you can do with these kinds of systems. So <coughs> people are used to do that, so a guy called, I think David Klein, he, he did that before um, the whole Google stuff came out, I think, actually. Um, and there are many other, you know, many, many other things you can do. So these are very old, these kind of things. So um, and these go way back out, you know, a long, quite a long time, actually, many, many years ago. Good. So uh, it's time for a break. So remember, you're going to, again, one of you is going to come up and tell us what you've been doing. Yeah. So let's meet back in 20, 20 minutes. Thank <laughs> you.